All right. Uh, well, why don't we uh, just prepare to be in God's Word today? Sweet time of worship and, uh, and uh, fellowship so far. Uh, I, obviously, this is our last Sunday in, in the, uh, well, in 2018. It's hard to even say 2018. We're going to 2019. Um, but as we look back at the end of the year and look ahead to a, a new year, I was particularly reminded of, of this passage, and it's First uh, Peter chapter 4. So I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to First Peter chapter 4, and as you do, I'll just sort of um, catch you up as to what Peter has been talking about in this wonderful epistle. He is talking to Christians who are being persecuted, who are suffering, who are uh, scattered around uh, the, the region. And in chapter 3, prior to this, he was speaking of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus and of his example of patience, his example of submissiveness under unjust treatment. And as we come to chapter 4, Peter is exhorting the saints uh, to arm themselves with the same mind that Christ had um, regarding unjust treatment and just to be obedient to God in the midst of suffering uh, at the hands of men because Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Philippians tells us, right? And he's our example. And we know that persecution and suffering is part and parcel of the Christian life while we are in this world. But what does Peter exhort us to do? And that's what we're going to look at today. He exhorts the church to live this life in light of the life to come. And if you look at verse 7 of chapter 4, just as a way of sort of introducing this text, he says this, but the end of all things is at hand. We look at the end of just a year passing and going into the new year. Uh, But Peter says the end of, of everything is coming. In fact, it's at hand, and at hand is the word engizo. It means to draw near. It's approaching. It's quite close. And James and all of the rest of Scripture reminds us that we um, need to be ready because the coming of the Lord is at hand. James 5, 8 is just one of the many passages that also says this. He says, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Yes, a year is ending and another is approaching, but that is just gets us through life, right? I mean, just to see one year go and another come, that's just, that's life. Everybody does that. And that's just getting through. And and Christians, I think, are are not just supposed to just get through life. I I don't think that's our goal. I don't think we're just supposed to, I just got to get through another year. Sometimes we just get exasperated. We say things like that. But Christians are to be glorifying God through life, not just getting through life. Every single year that passes, I want to glorify Him more. And so, New Year's resolutions are, are not the answer. Um, we're not to resolve to live differently just because it's another year. We are to resolve to live differently because the end of all things is near. And that's what Peter is exhorting us to do today. And there are four things that Peter will tell us to do in spite of persecution and suffering that might come our way, in light of what will absolutely come our way. The end, but for Christians, a new beginning. And so, let's read through this passage. We're just going to look at a a handful of verses here in chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Let me read them. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God, we do come to your word today desiring to hear from you. These are your very words to your church, to your people. You are coming, and you ask that we would live a certain way in light of that truth I pray that you'd help us to see that truth today, to examine our hearts, to look at our lives, to see if there are any of these areas where we are lacking, 
we might, Lord, commit to love you better, to love others better, to pray more watchful and serious, as the word is said here, and all the things you exhort us to do. God, help us to be open. Prepare our hearts for what you want to teach us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's just four things we're going to look at today. Peter exhorts the church to be praying, to be loving, to be hospitable, and to be serving. So let's look at verse 7. He says again, but the end of all things is at hand. We are living in the last days, and that means the return of Jesus is fast approaching. We um, often say we're in the end times, right? We're in the, the last days. And uh, how are we to live in light of that truth? Many, many Christians believe that Jesus is coming soon uh, based on prophecy uh, charts and uh, political events right, and um, looking at all the things that are happening, but they often fail to apply that belief in the proper way. They fail to apply themselves to more diligent prayer. As we see the weight of eternity rushing towards us, we dare not take the need for prayer lightly. And so Peter says, we are to be serious and watchful in our prayers. If we really believe we live in the last days, it's, it's all the more appropriate that we give ourselves to prayer. Serious, watchful prayer. But I want to look at these two words just briefly. Serious is the Greek word sophroneo, and it means to be of sound mind or to be uh, in one's right mind or in control. It's used several times in Scripture, probably most notably in Mark chapter 5, verse 15, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man in Gadarene. And it says this, Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, so for now, and they were afraid. The, the reason this man is in his right mind is because he is sitting and clothed. If you remember the description of this man, he wasn't normally sitting and wasn't normally clothed. <laughs> and so thus was not in his right mind, not in control of himself. But when he encountered the Lord of all creation... He was in his right mind. He was in control of himself. It's also used in 2 Corinthians 5.13 in contrast to being beside oneself, which is a way of saying mad or crazy. In 2 Corinthians 5.13, Paul says this, For if we are beside ourselves, or crazy, uh, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, so for neo, it is for you. Now, that sounds weird. Why would Paul say, if we're just mad, it's for God? Well, think about Paul. Did Paul do the actions of a sane man? He was stoned and dragged out of the city, got right up, and went right back into that city. That's crazy, right? That is not sanity. That, that, that man was insane. His actions for God were insane. That's what he's talking about. He would willingly face a riotous mob intent on killing him. That was just Paul. And he says, if we do things that look like that, that's for God. But if it's of a sound mind and it's controlled, self-control, that's for you. That's the testimony for you. It's also used in contrast to thinking too highly of oneself. Paul uses it in Romans 12, 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, there's that word, sophroneo, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And when you put these things together, the fuller picture we get from this word serious, which is translated serious here in our passage, tells us that there are dangers to uncontrolled excitement and frenzy uh, in church or in our lives. There's danger in conceit. This is a sinful and self-indulgent world, isn't it? This world is is constantly selling you the idea of indulge self. But if we want to be ready for Christ's appearing, we can't lose our our mental or our moral balance. That's got to be in the right place. We have to keep a clear head and a clear conscience. And those things will help us to be more uh, prayerful. But another word is used here, not just serious, but he says watchful in your prayers. Now, a lot of people read this and go, that's right, I'm watching. I'm watching for the return of the Lord. That's what this is all about. That's not what this is all about. Because actually the watchful word, um, care is nepho, and it means to be sober, to be sober. And it carries the idea of being calm and collected 
in one's spirit. Calm and collected in spirit is uh, conducive to the act of praying, isn't it? The Christian's always busy, always worried, always fearful, never at rest in his heart, doesn't do a lot of praying. We're to do a lot of praying and to be sober, calm, collected about it. It's easy to get very busy. When the transition early uh, in April happened between Steve and my, myself, I printed off our church database, which is terribly out of date. <laughs> it does not have everybody that belongs to our church in that thing. So stay tuned. We will be coming back to you about that. <laughs> we want to get everybody's name there. But I printed it off, and I just did my best to go through there and just be praying for five, ten people a day. I just was trying to pray for you by name. And I will confess, over the, the busyness over the last few months, I have failed to do that. Why? I would say, busy. Busy. How can we be too busy to pray? Is that absurd? Prayer is probably the easiest thing you can do, and that's the most neglected thing. I haven't read a book on pastoral ministry when the pastors were asked, what thi- one thing do they wish they did more of where they didn't say prayer? They always say prayer. I wish I prayed more. I study, I see people, I preach, I do these things, but boy, I wish I prayed more. Everyone wishes they prayed more. But what I want to tell you is about this word watchful and the word serious. Neither of these words have anything to do with keeping up on the end time reports and watching news to alerts to us to the sign of Jesus is coming. If you like to do that as a hobby, that's great. That's not a big, that's, that's, that's okay. But I hate to spoil it for you, and Peter already did. He let the cow out of the bag. The end of all things is near. Jesus is coming back. You, you, you don't need to look and rattle, okay, when's he coming back? We're not called to do that. Instead, we know he's coming back. We're to be um, controlled of ourselves and sober-minded, calm and collected so that we devote ourselves to prayer. That's what we're called to do. And I want to give you an example in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 because a lot of people say, no, we're supposed to be watching. We're supposed to be watching for... Let me take you to another common passage. Just make a small left-hand turn to 1 uh, Thessalonians 5 that speaks about the the day of the Lord or the second coming of Jesus when Jesus returns uh, to judge the day of the Lord. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, a very well-known passage here. But there are some similar words being used. I just want you to to show you the emphasis here. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You don't need to, you, I don't need to tell you about times and seasons because he's going to come as a thief. We don't know when he's coming. We just know he's coming, and he's coming soon. Look what he says in verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, this is for the Christians, you are not in the darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And here it is in verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Now, this word, watch, is probably the word you thought was being used in our passage, to watch. It is that kind of word, gregoreo. It means to give strict attention to, to be cautious. What are we supposed to Watch. And then sober is used as well, and that's the word we just looked at in our passage. Sober and watchful over over what? Well, look at the context of the passage. You're not going to be overtaken by the judgment. Why? Because you're sons of the light, you're sons of the day. Don't sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Why? Verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober. There it is again, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. We're to be watchful over ourselves, walking the life, living the life we're called to live. So even in that context, we know, I don't need to tell you Jesus is coming. He says, I don't need to write to you. He's going to come. He's going to come as a thief at night, but he's coming. Just watch over your conduct, right? Watch. Going back to our passage in First Peter chapter Four, what is the idea here? Well, we're just constantly exhorted to to be prayerful in Scripture, prayerful over ourselves as well. 
And the reason is this, that sin interrupts fellowship with God, doesn't it? And uninterrupted fellowship with God is so important if you're going to walk in victory in this world. That when we walk in sin, we, 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 we interrupt that fellowship, and we feel it, don't we? Don't you? You're, it, it's hard. And you go, ah, oh, I just feel it, and I just, it's hard to come back to Him. But think about that. It's so sweet when you're always in fellowship with Him. And so we're exhorted, listen, He is coming back. You want to have that constant fellowship. You don't want to be in a place where you're not feeling that when He comes back. You want that. So be be sober, be, be calm, be collected so that you can focus on prayer and be serious so that you can control yourself because he is coming. These things will hinder us, um, hinder clear, reasonable, sober communication with God. We've got to have clear communication with God. And prayer is the number one way we do that and often the thing that we lack we're going to end the service just a tad early today, and we're going to spend some time in corporate prayer. We've done it a few times already, and I've just loved that. But we're just going to get together, and we're going to pray as a church. So be ready for that. But the second thing he exhorts us to be is to be loving. Verse 8, and above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. I love this, above all things. So much of Scripture tells us that, doesn't it? Above all things have fervent love. Love is agape. That's the word that's being used. That is the sacrificial love. That is a love that costs you something. Yeah, right? It's, it's not a love that I love people because they deserve my love. They've earned my love. No, it costs you. You sacrifice that. I will love them even if I don't think they're particularly lovable. We are to love and we're told to do that above all. Before all in order of importance is what that is speaking of. Let me give you a couple examples from Scripture uh, that we're probably familiar with. Colossians 3.12, verse 12 to, uh, 312 to 14, Paul writes this. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, and now look in this list here, tender mercies. Oh, yeah, it's so good to be merciful to people. Kindness, absolutely. We've got to be kind. Humility, meekness, humble and meek people, we are to be. Long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, right? We're going to just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bear with you. I'm going to forgive you again and again and again. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. All those things are so good, so important. But look what he says in verse 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. You want to be a perfect Christian, love. Love people. You can do a lot of things, but if you're not loving, you're lacking a lot of things. Love is the fruit of the Spirit, right? Galatians 5, 22. Um, there's the list there. Where is love in that list? Numero uno. That's Espanol if you're not familiar. No. Okay, it's number one. Love Number one, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentle, right? The, we are to love. That's number one. Many times I've met with people and said, oh, it's just hard for me uh, to love. Are you a Christian? Yeah. Well, it shouldn't be hard because you have the fruit of the Spirit, right? Because the fruit of the Spirit is love. You might not be able to love, but the Spirit can love through you. Do you have the Spirit? That's the question. The Spirit allows you to love and love without agape love. And it's more important than knowledge. It's more important than spiritual gifts and all those things. And we're told that in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says this, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal, right? I, I love that. Paul is talking in hyperbolic language, right? If I could speak every language known to man and even known to angels, but I don't have love, I'm just a loud, noisy thing. I'm just making a bunch of racket. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing, right? I mean, if I'm Joseph, if I'm Daniel, but I don't love, I'm nothing. And though, verse 3, I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but not have not love, I, it profits me nothing. It doesn't matter what 
you do, what gifts you have, what knowledge you have. If you don't have love, it equates to this, zero. Our love is the reason people will know we are Jesus' disciples. That is, that is the thing. And Jesus told his disciples in John 13, 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. A group of us were at the Ronald McDonald House on Christmas Eve. Uh, you saw a few pictures there, a long buffet of food uh, that was there presented. Many women and, and people donated food to make this wonderful buffet. There was a, a picture with all the gift bags on there. We put together gift bags for every family that would be in the home, 30 families. So 30 gift bags there. And it's, it was a small venue and a small group of people that were coming and going, so it was very hard for us to say, yeah, everyone come on down. So we had a small group that could actually be there, but I know that more people were involved in what took place. But I have to tell you, it was absolutely incredible. Time and time again, we were asked, why were we doing this? Like, what? Because this is the Ronald McDonald House, but you guys are a church, and you're coming in here, and you're doing, why are you doing this? So what a privilege to say, we just wanted to love you. We just wanted to love you. So a couple would come in and sit down and get some food and eat, and, and then it allowed for a few of us to maybe go over and get conversation going. And I think Haley was involved in every one of those conversations. But, but let me tell you, it, it was that a surprise. Come on. It was a surprise. <laughs> but by the end, you know, these people were leaving and hugging, hugging us and, 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 and tears. And one man at the end came back, and he handed me a five-pound note because he just couldn't accept that love without giving something back. He just, he's like, I, I just, I, you guys have done so much. I can't believe, I just, this is nothing. I know this is so little, but I have to give something back. So I get to put a five pound note in the offering from James. Remember James? Because he couldn't, he, the love was too much. He was like, I, I don't understand this. And the buffet, the picture doesn't do it justice. The buffet was incredible. People would come over, they thought, oh, it's free food, okay, it's going to be, and they saw it, and they went, what? We are to love people in the church in such a way that outsiders look at how we love one another and go, wow, I want to be part of that family. But you know what happens a lot of times in the church? They see the bickering, the infighting, the division, they go, why would I want to be part of that family? You don't even love each other, right? Right? What a great testimony to hear from, from visitors coming and say, I've just been here five minutes. I feel loved, right? That is what you want to have in the church. You want to have the love sensed among, I, I sense love here, right? There's unity. There's not division. But then we take that love and we take it out, right? And what an opportunity we had to do that at that Ronald McDonald house. And I will remind you, we were also able to do that because of the giving gracious hearts here. We were over budget and we said, we're operating on our budget, so this is extra money. What would God have us do with extra money? Well, we bought some sound equipment because we needed that, and we went and loved on some people. To God be the glory. Love is the reason people know we are Jesus' disciples, and it says everything. Everything. You can preach a hundred sermons, but if you don't love people, it just won't communicate deeply. We've got to love people. And Jesus rebukes the church that has abandoned love. Remember the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2. He says this, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have preserved, uh, sorry, persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. That is a long list of great things the church is doing. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Literally translated, that text reads, you have abandoned your love the first. Jesus didn't say you have no love. He said you have abandoned the love you had at first. Listen to um, how D.A. Carson describes what took place at this church in Ephesus. He says this, they still proclaim the truth, but they no longer passionately love him who is the truth. They still perform good deeds, but no longer out of love, brotherhood, and compassion. They preserve the truth and witness courageously, but forget that love is the great witness to the truth. It is not so much that their genuine virtues have squeezed love out, but that no amount of good works 
wisdom and discernment in matters of church discipline or patient endurance and hardship, hatred of sin or disciplined doctrine can ever make up for lovelessness. Love must be above all. But notice that he says fervent love. Did you see that word? Fervent love, ectenes. It means stretched out, strained. Mm, that makes it even a little bit harder here. The idea is this, is that it's a love that is extended to reach uh, the ones it's intended to reach, even if it causes straining and stretching of the muscles. It's even used in the horse's legs, of the ho- muscles of a horse's legs in the context of, of that, that they're exerting um, um, energy. It's, it's one's power to their fullest extent. That is the idea. Love takes a little bit of energy, doesn't it? It takes a little bit of effort. No, it takes a lot. He says, have fervent love. Stretch yourself up. So this speaks of one who is not self-centered. You can't be self-centered and stretch yourself out to give love. It's just, it's impossible. You must give yourself to others. That is, a, that is the calling here. Fervent love. And then look what he says about love. For love will cover a multitude of sins. I think Peter is, is probably referring to Proverbs ten twelve, which says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. But that is true. Love does cover a multitude of sins, both the sins of the one loving and the one being loved. When one Christian truly loves his fellow Christian or Christians, then he's not going to punish that person, right, for their faults. He's not going to gossip about them. He's going to cover them. He's going to forgive them. That's the idea. Now, let me just say this. That's not to say we're to cover up major sins that should be confessed, right? Because we shouldn't harbor sin in our hearts. We should encourage people to confess that sin, seek forgiveness, reconciliation, that we might not have sin dwelling in the church. But all the little nitpicky things we get caught up in sometimes, isn't it easier just to forgive that, to cover that and say, you know what, maybe having a bad day. It may be, may be a little bit grumpy, right? Who here has not woken up grumpy, right? I haven't had my coffee yet. Hold on, right? We forgive again and again and again because this is how God treats us. He forgives me again and again and again. Listen to Wayne Grudem. He says this, Where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses and even some large ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. But where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion, every action is liable to misunderstanding, and conflicts abound to Satan's perverse delight. Satan loves to see conflict in the church over all these little things. But we're to be loving, have fervent love, and that love will cover a multitude of sins. Third, we're to be hospitable. Be hospitable. Look at verse 9. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Without grumbling. Be hospitable. Hospitable is is friendly to strangers. It's a stranger lover. That's what that word literally uh, means. Uh, Paul says in Romans 12, 13, that we need to be distributing to the needs of the saints, so so giving to the needs of the body, but also given to hospitality. So not only do we meet the needs of those in our in our body, but also outside of our body. And the idea is here is to, is to Christians who you don't know, who, who are traveling. That was particularly the case in Peter's time as he's writing to Christians who were uprooted from their home, and they had no choice but to turn to the hospitality of other Christians in other places. So they were traveling, and they were needing, they were needing um, beds, they were needing food, they were needing clothing, and it was constantly happening here. In those days, persecuted Christians traveled a lot. Love will show itself in hospitality. Um, you guys did a good job of that with the Grace Chapel team back in April, right? You didn't know those people. You just had to trust me that I knew them well enough, right? And you're taking strangers into your home, like, okay, I can trust, like, I can like, rip off my stuff, right? Um, uh, right, but, you know, some of you had people in your home. That's the idea. We put strangers up in our homes because love shows itself in that way. But did you notice the words, uh, without grumbling? <laughs> yes, without grumbling means don't moan about it, right? Don't moan about it. Do, it. do it willingly. Do it lovingly. Christians should open up their homes to others and do it all 
without grumbling. Listen to this quote. Without grumbling is a frank recognition that the practice of hospitality could become costly, burdensome, and irritating. The Greek term denotes a muttering or a low speaking as a sign of displeasure. It depicts a spirit that is the opposite of cheerfulness. It got to the point where it was just constant, and I think for some Christians, they were just like, oh, not again. i got to take some more people in my home. I want peace and quiet. We're to be stranger lovers. And there's a couple privileges that come with that, and I want to point just three of them out, and we'll move to the next point. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, many have unwittingly entertained angels. That's got to be one of the most mind-boggling verses in Scripture. And I never knew it existed until I was a young junior high age kid in Oregon, and my, lived, and my dad brought this up because we were living on the outskirts of the capital of Oregon, which is Salem. We were living in a sort of a country area. And a man came to our door seeking, seeking shelter, food, and he said he would do a little bit of work to, to, to do that. First of all, we didn't even understand how he got here because we were in the boonies. That means the middle of nowhere. Um, and, and my dad refused. We go to church that Sunday, and that same man is talking to Christians in the parking lot asking the same thing. And he's looking at the guy like, I know that guy from somewhere. We get in the car, we start loading up, and we drive away, and then it hits him. He's like, that's the guy that came to our door. And he whips the car around, so I'm freaking out. Like, what happened, right? And he goes back to, to, to find him, and the guy's gone. Like, literally had disappeared. And like, what are you looking for? Like, We're looking for the guy that came here. He was the guy that came to our door. He's like, I got, had two opportunities to get him. I think I missed an opportunity to entertain an angel. And as a young kid, you respond like you do. You go, what? You know? Like, entertain a what? I had no idea this thing was a real thing. But he honestly thought he missed an opportunity. But what that did is that the next time we had someone knock on our door and someone asked the same thing, that man was sleeping on the floor of our living room that night because my dad did not want to pass up another opportunity. So you never know you could be entertaining angels. Secondly, you have an opportunity to bless Jesus. In Matthew 25, verse 40, uh, Jesus is talking about, you know, if you, if you saw someone in need and you clothed them, right? If they were naked and you clothed them, you fed them, those things you did unto me. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So when you do that to uh, someone else, you're doing it to Jesus. You bless him. So do it for him. You don't even do it for them. Do it for him. It blesses him. A third reason is you might have an opportunity for a reward. In Matthew 10, 41, he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward, and he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. We don't do it for the reward, but you never know how God is going to, uh, to, to use that. I, 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 I know I've told this story before, but it was Christmas, and we were, we were actually decorating the tree, which for our family, particularly at that time, the kids were young, was like a holy moment, right? And I was about to like put the, the star on the top, which is the holiest of moments. <laughs> it was like, I heard, I heard music, oh, and just then the doorbell rang, and we actually stopped and answered it, and it was a salesman. Now, my normal attitude would have been, do you know what you just interrupted, <laughs> right? But he was just doing door-to-door stuff, and I don't know what came over us. We said, you want to come in? And he came in. <laughs> All right. And we'd offered him some cocoa or something like that. And unbelievable. But this guy just started talking to me, talking to him, talking. And this is the phrase he said out of nowhere. He said, yeah, it's good to come in here and stuff. He's like, I'm looking, I'm looking for something to believe in. Hmm. Well, have a nice night. No, I mean, I mean okay. <laughs> does it get any easier than that? I mean, it's like a, like a slow pitch. There you go. Hit that one, right? <laughs> out of the park. I got something you can believe in. I sat down on the couch with him. My little, I don't how old was Ryan then? No, he was younger. He, he saw what was happening between dad and a stranger. He goes and disappears upstairs. He comes down with my Bible and he brings it to me and he hands it to me. Like, oh, thank you, son. And we told him later, that was the Holy Spirit using you through this stranger who came into our house. 
you just never know what blessing you might receive. For me, that was my reward. I said, oh, the Holy Spirit's using my son to say, Dad, you're about to share the gospel here, and you bet I did. He's like, yeah, I tried different things. I was looking into Islam. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Let me, let me, hold on, let me, let me. I got the truth for you, brother. You just never know. Be hospitable. I know people like to get in their home, say, this is my castle, right, and close in and put the drawbridge up and all that. It's, it's not. God has given that place for you so you can bless others with it. Be hospitable. The last thing is to be serving, to be serving. And this is verses 10 and 11. As we, each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As each one has received a gift. So each one has been given some gift. Everybody in the church has been given a gift or set of gifts. God has graciously given certain spiritual gifts to us so that we can discharge those um, as special duties that God has called us to. But he says this, that we receive this gift and we're to minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Manifold means multifaceted grace of God. God's grace is, is immense. We really can't wrap our minds around God's grace. It's much more than we uh, think. And if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives us an idea of that. Let me just show you really briefly here. 1 Corinthians 15, just make a short left-hand turn. First Corinthians fifteen, ten. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. That's an interesting passage, isn't it? So Paul makes it clear that he, he was what he was only by God's grace. That's absolutely true. But... At the same time, Paul says his grace toward me was not in vain because, well, Paul put his own God-spirited or inspired efforts to, to work with God's grace, right? I labored, right, he says. And the idea is that if we're, if we're bad stewards of the manifold grace of God, then it's, it's, it's as if that grace was given to us in vain. It just, it's wasted. It stops with us when it's meant to move through us to others. And that's what Paul is saying. He's like, I, I just would have been in vain. So I labored to make sure that, that I, you know, passed that on. But then it wasn't even me. It was God's grace through me. You see that? It's incredible. And so the idea is that these gifts that you're given are to be used for the benefit of others. God's grace of those gifts given to you is to benefit others. And examples of these gifts, we don't have time to go in them today. You can read them on your own in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11. They're also listed in Romans 12. Six to eight, but a few basic points about gifts real quick. There's a lot of diversity in spiritual gifts, a lot of diversity. So diversity in what and how and when and how frequent uh, each gift operates. Uh, There's purpose is that they be used for the benefit of others. That's certain in Scripture. It's for the edification of the uh, church body and not for the individual using them. Uh, another thing is that uh, every believer has some gift or a combination of, uh, of gifts. Um, they're given to each each one, and that will differ from person to person. And the gifts are given by the Spirit of God according to His will, not your will. So you can't will God to give you a certain gift. God knows who needs what and when. Our responsibility is not so much to uh, get them, but to use them. He'll give you what you need. And we're to be a steward, a good steward, one who governs a household, right? A steward's responsible to manage and take care of all that's been entrusted to him. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 16 to 17, Paul says this, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Paul looked at the gospel as a, a stewardship. I've got to do this. God has given me the gospel to preach. I've got to be a good steward of it. So that includes properly using gifts properly using gifts, using them for the purpose for which they were given, which is to be used for the benefit of everyone. And it's a responsibility we must not neglect. The key word here is minister, minister, 
literally means to use it to serve others. We are to use our gifts in the service of others. If you're in a church and you're not using your gift, you're not serving others. You've got to know your gift, find your gift, and use it to serve others. Look for opportunities. Sometimes people just don't even know they have a gift. You just got to like sign up and volunteer and see if that works out. Well, apparently I didn't, I couldn't pour coffee. (laughs) All right. That didn't work out. So I'll try kids ministry. I'll pour coffee on them. No, but you try to, you just try to find an area there where you, you start to go, oh wait, God has gifted me. I never knew, I never knew, I knew as an administrator, I could administrate things in kids ministry. And I did, I administrated all these things. I had schedules and plans and I had teachers doing it all. And the first time I ever taught was because I lost my fourth and fifth grade teachers. And I had nobody that would come. And I said, well, I guess, I guess we'll have to do it. So Jody and I went in there. I had never taught before in my life. I didn't know I could teach until I started with fourth and fifth graders. <laughs> and that was, my, that was my crowd then. That was it. I was like, okay, I'm a hit with them. <laughs> That's all I can do. But you've got to start somewhere is the point, right? So be serving. Every, every part is important. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12 about the, the church body being like a human body, right? Because the ear, the eye, the nose, everything's important. It all works together. To give you an illustration, a man was rebuilding the, the engine to his lawnmower, and when he had finished putting it all back together, he had one small little part left over. You ever done that? You put something, you take it apart, you put it back together, you're like, what in the world is this? But then you, you turn it on, and it works. So like, you started the lawnmower, oh, it works. I guess this was, you know, not needed, until he realized he couldn't turn it off. <laughs> like, oh, where's that piece? Obviously, that had an important function. The same is with us. Even the smallest, seemingly least important part of the body of Christ is important. Every person is important, is what we're speaking of. Going back to the passage here, look at verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak of the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. So Peter illustrates the importance of using these gifts by by summarizing them into just two categories. So real quick, we'll end with this, okay? Okay speaking gifts and serving gifts. So look at the speaking gift here again. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Speak is literally to speak. (laughs) There's nothing about that word. It means to talk. So if it would include teaching and preaching and, and exhorting and words of encouragement there, and you should do that according to the oracles of God, the divine revelations, the word of God, the truth, the truth, right? That's what we're speaking of. The oracles of God are God's word. Paul uses that same word in Romans 3, verses 1 to 2. He said, What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the prophet of, of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. What was the biggest thing about the Jews? They had divine revelation. They had the law that was given to them. So in other words, if you teach, teach the Bible, the revealed word of God. I have nothing important to say to anybody this is the only thing I have important to communicate, God's Word. So if you speak, speak what God has given to you. That's a gift of um, speaking gifts. Serving gifts, he says, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God uh, supplies. So with whatever, you know, God gives you. So it's important to recognize that it's God who has empowered him with what God has given you. God has given them the gift, and he's enabled them uh, to use it. So the point is this, if you serve, serve with the ability that God has given you to serve. Do it. Do it faithfully and do it willingly. And this is what he ends with, that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. There is no pride in serving the Lord because it's not you or your effort. It's, it's Him. And the goal of all this is ultimately the glory of God, not your glory. God is glorified when the church is edified. And I'm going to close with looking at Ephesians chapter 4. If you want to turn there really briefly, just to the left, we'll close with Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 11 to 16. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, it says this. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What a rich passage. We have all these different gifts that are given to equip the saints and it all is for the edifying of the body so that you will be a perfect man coming to the full stature of Christ that we'd be a complete body, joined and knit together, and we'd have everything the body needs. God has given us, in this church body, everything we need. Do you know that? Like, there's, this body is is complete. We're not missing a foot, right? There's, There's, a gallbladder is not missing. We have everything we need in this body. And as I look into the new year, I look at what has God given us in this body, and what can we accomplish through what he has given us in his body. But because we're complete, aren't we? We have everything we, we need. And so as I, I look at the new year, I think of our church is doing a good job of a lot of things. I love how you love one another. I love how you're desiring to have more opportunities to love outside the church as well. I love how you want to serve and to be involved in those things. Look into this next year at ways you can increase any of that. Are there ways that you're holding back? Are there parts you're, you're not involved in? You want to be. What's holding you back? Be involved. Look for opportunities to serve. You don't even have to come to me. You can just do it on your own. Go, go adopt uh, one of our widows. Take them under your wing and say, that's going to be my project this year. I'm just going to love those people. You don't have to go through me. You could, you could just do that. Amazing, right? Freedom to love? Yep. Go on ahead. There's not going to be a limit. I'm not going to like, oh, we've capped it. Cap on love. Too much love going on here. You're never going to hear me say that. Love one another. Serve one another. Be hospitable. But above all, let's really be a praying church. Let's really be a praying church. Some of you subscribe to the Christian Institute, and we get updates about what the Christian Institute is standing for and fighting for um, in the government. And there's an update bulletin out there if you want to read through what's going on. But they've given a little uh, a prayer bookmark to kind of pray through things through the new year, listen to what to pray for on Sunday and on Monday and on Tuesday and those kind of things. And find something like that that will help you. Just be prayerful. I'm just going to read you a few things, and here's what I'm asking you to do. I ask you to just squeeze together in groups or wherever you are. I don't want anyone sitting alone, all right? You can not be shy here. Get get together and just pray. It's not a hard thing to pray. Just, Just talk to God. Pray for our church that we would be, going into this next year, we would focus on loving more, serving more, being more hospitable. That's what Peter exhorts us to do. Why? Because the end is all near. We're going to lose opportunity. It's going to, it's going to end. So let's make most of the opportunity while it's here. There's also things to pray for. As you know, the battle goes on uh, for marriage in the, in the government. Pray that the government will not introduce no-fault divorce and that same-sex marriage will not be forced on Northern Ireland. They're, they're still battling that. Uh, smacking Pray that love, loving parents won't be criminalized for gently disciplining their own children and that Christians would take a stand against unwarranted state intervention in family life. Um, out of school settings, pray that the government guidance will not be used to interfere with, with church youth groups and study schools. They're trying to do that. Uh, transsexualism, pray for overwhelming opposition to the proposals to make changing sex much easier and that those who disagree with trans ideology may be protected because it's not even okay to disagree. Uh, so all, all kinds of things you can be praying for. I'm sure you read papers. I'm sure you know what's going on. If some of those things come to your heart and you want to pray for those, please feel free to, to do that. But we're going to take some time, okay? Just get in some groups right now. Start moving together, and um, we'll pray. And then I'll come up and close us in prayer, and the worship team will come up and close us with an ending song here.